In this lecture, we will be discussing junctional dysrhythmias, and this is Ginger Keen. Our objectives are to identify EKG characteristics of dysrhythmias that originate in the AV junction. We're going to describe the hemodynamic consequences of selected junctional dysrhythmias and describe the clinical management of patients with junctional dysrhythmias. In this slide, we see that we've already covered the sinus node. We've covered atria dysrhythmias. Now we're going to do junctional and all learning about all the characteristics of the beats that originate from the AV junction. The cells in the AV node serve two separate functions. The AV node slows down conduction and allows the ventricles enough time to fill. In the same area, there are specialized pacemaker cells which have the ability to spontaneously generate an impulse. Beats, beats which arise from this area are called junctional beats. You may also hear them called nodal beats, AV nodal beats. The AV junction serves as a, an escape or secondary pacemaker, a backup if the SA node fails. This slide illustrates lead to pl electrode placements and we're going to review the depolarization towards the positive electrode. So as you can see, from negative to positive, it will give a positive deflection. If you have an impulse that comes from positive going towards negative, it will give you a negative deflection especially when you're looking at the AV junction. If an impulse comes from the AV node, it's gonna go in the opposite direction. So what you will find is that the P wave will look inverted or upside down, opposite than the positive deflection P wave you would normally see. When beats originate in the junction, the timing of depolarization determines what the beat will look like. If the impulse depolarizes the atria before it depolarizes the ventricles, you will see an inverted P wave before the QRS. Normally, the PR interval will be very short. So if you're measuring your PR, you're going to see it is very short compared to a normal PR interval. Oftentimes it's 0 0.10 seconds or less. The QRS will be normal because it originated in the atrium, just like a sinus, and every single impulse that originates in the atrium will go down the bundles of hiss at the same time, creating a normal QRS. If the same patient, or another patient, I should say, the QRS impulse is conducted through the ventricles if the impulse is happening at this same time. So if the ventricles are depolarizing at the same time the atriums are polarizing, or after, let's say the atrium depolarizes after, the ventricles depolarize, then what you're going to see is a inverted P after the QRS. These P's often appear in distortion of the ST segment, and if the impulse is conducted simultaneously, integrate to the ventricles and the retrograde of the atria and the atrial depolarization will mask by the larger muscle mass of the ventricles, and the inverted P will be hidden in the QRS seen in the last example. So you may have an inverted P before the QRS, you may have an inverted P after the QRS, and you may have no P at all, which is hidden in the QRS. Just to review, junctional beats, the P waves are inverted. We're looking in lead two. P waves before, after, or hidden in the QRS. Again, they are inverted. 
your PRI will be short, 0.12 seconds or less. Your QRS will be normal, 0 0.10 seconds or less. Again, this is because it originates, the impulse originates in the atrium and goes down the bundles of hiss at the same time, depolarizing the ventricles at the same time, giving you a normal QRS. PJCs can occur as couples or paired couplets or in patterns such as bigeminy, trigeminy, or quagemony, as we discussed in the PACs. It is common practice to describe the frequency of premature beats. Example, rare, occasional, frequent, where rare PVs, PJCs would be one to three per minute, occasional would be three to six per minute, and frequent greater than six per minute. Three, J, three PJCs in a row is considered a junctional rhythm, and it would be named as a base rate, its own rate. PJCs are the least common of premature beats. Low atrial PACs can also present with an inverted P wave, but won't have a short PR. So looking at your premature junctional contraction in this strip, the underlying basic rhythm is usually regular. It's interrupted by the premature beats, the PJCs. The rate, you can determine the underlying rate if you did your R to R's. You can also determine what your junctional rate is. Your P waves are upright in your sinus rhythm and then they are inverted, inverted in your junctional rhythm. Your PR, if you look at your PR for your junctional beats, it's very short. It looks like about maybe two, two and a half boxes. So it would be 0 0.10 or less. You can't measure a, P, um, a PR interval if the P wave is after the QRS because you have to have the P before the R. Your QRS is normal. Again, it's all coming from the atrium. So anytime your impulse originates in the atrium, you're gonna have a normal QRS. The common causes of PJCs Sometimes they just happen for no apparent reason. Uh, sometimes stimulants, again, these are premature beats and there's a separate site in within the atrium that has become taken over as the pacemaker. So because it's premature and your heart responds to the fastest and strongest impulse, so an air, area within the junction can trigger a premature beat. Other things such as CHF, electrolyte imbalances, hypoxia or digitoxicity. Usually there's not too much significance and the management usually is not treated unless they're very frequent. And then you wanna look at what the possible cause is and eliminate that cause. Escape beats. Now, remember, premature beats occur early, earlier than the next R to R interval. Escape beats occur because the primary pacemaker has failed, in contrast to the premature beats that, again, occur early. So this is, if you're looking at this rhythm strip, you have sinus rhythm, sinus rhythm, then what happened is your SA node did not fire. So what the backup pacemaker did is produced an escape junctional beat. So they call that a junctional escape beat. We know it's junctional because there's no P wave. It's probably hidden in the QRS. We know it came from the junction because the, Q, the QRS is normal. So again, remember we talked about the pacemaker, the primary pacemaker being your SA node, fires at a rate of 60 to 100. This beat is delayed. If you were to determine what the heart rate is between these R to Rs, it actually comes to about 45 beats per minute or 
because there's 33 little small boxes between those R to R. So I look at my small box conversion table and that heart rate, so there is a heart rate that would be like 45. And as we talked about before, a junctional rhythm would fire at a rate of 40 to 60. So this is your escape. So when your SA node failed, your junction kicked in and it produced a junctional escape beat. It may convert to a whole junctional escape rhythm, but it didn't. Your SA node came back after the junctional escape beat and resumed as a normal sinus rhythm. For a junctional rhythm, its rate is at an inherent rate of 40 to 60. The junctional QRS is normal or narrow because it originated in the atrium. So please remember that. Your rhythm is regular. Your junctional rhythm is regular, R to R. Your rate is 40 to 60. Your P waves will be either inverted before the QRS, during the QRS, or after the QRS, but they would all be inverted because remember we talked about if we have your SA node normally would cause going in the direction of positive, negative to positive would give you a normal P wave. But if your impulse originates at the bottom of the atrium, it goes in the opposite direction and therefore will give you an opposite looking P. Not very pretty, but hopefully you get the idea. So your PR is also going to be pretty short because if the normal sinus beat comes, originates from the SA node at the, near the uh, superior in vena cava at the top of the atrium, this is very close to the bundles of hiss. So what happens is this can go right down the bundles of hiss pretty quickly. So again, you remember, you're talking about how long it takes for your atriums to depolarize. And if it's very close to the area or the bundles of hiss, your PR interval is going to be a lot shorter. It'll zip right down. And again, your QRS is normal. It'll be the same as if it came from the SA node or the sinus node. Your QT should be normal, again, less than half the distance of R to R. The causes of our junctional rhythm <clears throat> could be due to drug effects, things that slow down or decrease the, the impulse through the AV node, such as DIG, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers. If there is any damage to the AV node, such as in with an inferior wall MI, if there's a problem with the SA node, so therefore you have a backup pacemaker, your junction, rhythm, your junction will kick in as the primary pacemaker, and other things that can cause it is like hypoxia. The significance or clinical significance is because you don't have that good atrial squeeze to empty the atriums into the ventricles, you can lose that atrial kick, which again is about 25% of your cardiac output. So therefore you will have a decreased cardiac output. And oftentimes the rhythm is bradycardia, 40 to 60, and that would result in a decreased cardiac output as well. So the clinical management again would be if this patient is symptomatic, you would manage them with the Brady algorithm. This rhythm is called an accelerated because it exceeds the normal rate of the junction, which is 40 to 60, but it's not fast enough to be considered a tachycardia. So when it's accelerated junctional rhythm, it is regular. The rate would be between 60 to 100. Your P waves are still inverted, either before, during, or after the QRS. Your PR is short, 0 0.10 seconds or less. Your QRS is normal because it originated in the atrium, and your QT is normal. It is just the rate is between 60 to 100. So we call that accelerated. The cause oftentimes is an enhanced automaticity and at the AV junction. You'll see most often it due to digitoxicity. 
There could be ischemia at the AV junction, such as in, with an inferior wall MI or with CHF. Again, you've lost your atrial kick because your atriums are not squeezing, synchronized into the ventricles, so that can cause a decrease in your cardiac output. Usually, because the rate is faster, between 60 to 100, it's much more tolerated. The treatment underlying the cause is the primary clinical management. Also, review what medications they're on. Example, if they're on DIG, you would want to discontinue that. And if needed, support the decreased cardiac output if necessary. My, most times when you have somebody that's in an accelerated junctional rhythm, it's transient, meaning it doesn't last too long. An example in this rhythm is that the P waves are hidden in the QRSs. Sometimes people mistake this for AFib or an accelerated junctional has a because a uh, AFib has you can't see the P waves, especially if the baseline is tiny little um and sometimes AFib the baseline might be so finely quivering that you can't really pick up so it looks almost straight line-ish. But just remember the difference between accelerated junctional rhythm and atrial fib is that accelerated junctional rhythm is regular. The R to R is regular. AFib, the R to R is irregularly irregular. So don't make that mistake. In a junctional rhythm that is heart rate greater than 100, we call that junctional tachycardia. Anytime you have a heart rate greater than 100, you're going to put tachycardia on that interpretation. Again, it's a regular rhythm and your P waves are inverted, either before, during, or after the QRS. You have a short PR interval. Your QRS is normal because it originated in the atrium, and your QT may or may not be measurable. It depends if you can even pick out T waves. So this is an example of a junctional tachycardia. And usually it won't be more than like 120, I would say, because junctional tachycardia, again, this is normally a 40 to 60 uh, rate that you'll find for a junctional rhythm. So it's not oftentimes you're going to see a junctional tachycardia. The cause usually is due to an increased automaticity, such as in digitoxicity being the most common cause. And again, ischemia at the AV junction, it can cause an irritation and increased automaticity, such as in an inferior wall MI or acute coronary syndrome. And the clinical significance, again, loss of that atrial kick will cause the decrease in cardiac output, but oftentimes the rate of that junctional attack are really high enough to cause symptoms of tachycardia symptoms. So again, you're gonna look at what would be the potential cause of it to, and it usually doesn't last long. So withdrawing the causative agent, one of the following, symptomatic junctional tachycardia. So you may have to give a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker or amiodarone. If the patient is asymptomatic, this rhythm is treated with just withdrawing causative agents. So let's do a practice session. So you're going to pause the video. You're going to do rhythms 821, 836, and 841. 836, this strip belongs to a 78-year-old gentleman who comes into the ED after fainting at home. Blood pressure is 72 over 50. He is pale, diaphoretic, and dyspnea, and his medications include a heart pill and water pill. So pause the video and complete those practice strips and then resume the video and then we'll re review them. In this rhythm, 821, this rhythm is regular, if, except it has a 1PJC in the fourth complex. So you have P waves that are sinus and you have one inverted. So the underlying rhythm, and again, the underlying rhythm would be from R to R. And this R is a little early, so we would, we see that as a premature beat. So the R to R, and we look at what the underlying 
rate is at about 60. Your P waves, obviously most of them are sinus except for that one premature B, and it is inverted. And the difference between a PAC and a PJC is the P wave. In a PAC, the P wave is upright. In a PJC, it is either inverted or hidden in the QRS or after the QRS. So that's the difference. The P wave is inverted. Remember where that impulse comes from, from the bottom of the atrium instead of the top of the atrium. The normal PRI for your sinus beats are, let's see, we have about three boxes or so, but you have about two boxes for the PJC. Oops, it's a little messy, but you have a much shorter PR interval for the might be even two and a half, but I would say it's 0 0.08 or 0 0.10, but it's much shorter for the PJC than it is for the sinus beats. Your QRS is normal, so if you're measuring your QRS, you measure from the beginning of the R wave, because there's no Q, to where the S wave, so it looks like you have two boxes. Your QT interval, so from the beginning of your QRS, let me find a strip that we haven't touched yet. There we go. And to the where the T wave comes back to the isoelectric line. And you're measuring how many, and it looks like about 10 and a half to 11. So we'll say it's 0.44. So your interpretation of this rhythm is normal sinus rhythm with one PJC. And it is, if you want to be more specific, it's in the fourth complex. So again, you count one, two, three, four of this strip. It's in the fourth complex. In 836, again, this has a scenario. So this page, this strip belongs to the 78-year-old gentleman who comes into the ED after fainting at home. His blood pressure is 72 over 50. He's pale, diaphoretic, and dyspneic. His medications include heart pill and water pill. So you look at this rhythm. It is regular. The heart rate would be 41. P waves, it looks like they're after. If you look at the pointiness of the after the QRS, that is considered the P waves after. And you cannot do a PRI. I believe in the book, she might have, Huff has a PRI measurement, I can't remember, but you cannot measure the PRI and it's not significant to anything. So we are not going to measure it. Your QRS is normal. So if you're measuring from your QRS, it looks like about two boxes, 0 0.08. Your QT, so you're measuring from the beginning of the R wave to where the T wave comes to the isoelectric line, and it again looks like about 10 to 11 boxes, so 0.40 to 0.44. So, what is your interpretation of this rhythm? It is a junctional rhythm. If you are a monitor tech, you would notify the clinician. Nurses, you would have to treat this patient because you have to determine are they stable or unstable. In that scenario, the patient's blood pressure is very low. They are showing signs of unstable bradycardia. So you would treat them with bradycardia management, meaning that you would, again, make sure you have IV access. You would make sure you give them atropine, 0 0.5 milligrams IV push. You might want to put transcutaneous pacer on them, and also potentially you might have to start them on a dopamine drip or an epi drip. In 841, this rhythm is regular, and you will have a heart rate of 84. Your P waves, you have, you can't see them, so they are hidden within the QRS. Again, just to remind you, the difference between this rhythm and atrial fib is that this rhythm is regular. Atrial fib would be irregular. So just remember that. 
because if you try to make this baseline very quivery, it's again, remember your your monitor can pick up outside interference of any kind of electricity. So it's not like you're going to have an absolute straight line because you have lots of electricity within the patient's body and within the room. So you remember this is a regular rhythm and it would be junctional. Your P waves are not existent or hidden, so you can't do a PRI. Your QRS, if you measure from your QRS, you're measuring from the beginning of the Q or, or the R, because there's no Q, to where the S comes to the J point. It looks about two boxes. So your measurement is 0 0.08. Some of them look a little bit even smaller of 0 0.06. Your QT interval, let's see, you have a measure from the beginning of your QRS to where the T wave comes back. Just gonna do a couple. And I believe it's about nine to 10 boxes. So it would be 0.36 to 0.40. And your interpretation of this rhythm would be accelerated junctional rhythm. This concludes this content. So don't forget, make sure you do your homework, practice your homework, and then we will review that in the next session.